Good morning and welcome to UCM. We are thrilled that you're here today to join us. Union Church of Manila is a church of many nations committed to making disciples who are transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. We invite you to help us fulfill this mission. If you're new to UCM, allow us to connect with you so we know how to serve you better. Please grab a welcome card in the pew in front of you and fill it out with your information. You may drop the card off in any of the offering boxes on your way out, or you can give it to any of our ushers. One more thing, we encourage you to visit the welcome area at the fellowship hall after the service. While you're there, you'll meet many of our church leaders and members of the community. They'll be happy to receive your card. Now, let us begin our time of worship together. Good morning, a joyful morning to everyone here. Good morning, Union Church of Manila, a church um, of many nations, and we are committed to making disciples transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Welcome to all of you here in person and those joining us online. My name is Fit Lozano, and I'm, it's my privilege to welcome you this morning. Now, if you're new here, 
We do have, um, and you have children with you, we have an amazing Kingdom Kids program that catered to children from the age of two all the way to grade six. And they meet at the basement two below us. But if your kids are a little older and they are from grade seven all the way to grade 12, they are very welcome to join our youth program, Disciples of Christ United, and they gather on level five. And if you need some help with navigating around our building, please feel free to approach any of, of our friendly ushers. They have a name tag on, and they'll be more than happy to assist you. And if you've been worshiping with us this month, September is a special month because it's our missions month. And um, we have a guest speaker, Jess Smith, and um, it's an amazing month that you'll be hearing our um, Philippine um, Institute missionary. They'll be, they'll be leading us in some of the worship songs at the end of the service. And so let us call ourselves to worship this morning. Come, let us gather together in unity to exalt the Lord. He is the light of the world. He is worthy to be praised. And the congregation respond. We gather as the church to lift our hearts and our voices to exalt the Lord. He alone is worthy to be praised. And with that, let us call ourselves to worship the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, as we glorify and magnify his name this morning. pray. Dear Father, our Lord and Savior, we lift to you this day as we worship you and thank you. We pray for our pastors, Pastor Chad and Pastor Noah, as they continue to guide us to your word. We pray that you prepare our hearts to receive your message and to act on it. 
we raise to you our missions partners for your continuous provisions and for their consistent ministry. We pray for everyone who are going through tough times, sickness, on bad weather, financial challenges, that you will be the one that everyone will find refuge. All of this, our Father, we lift up to you. If you are able to, let us stand to pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This September, Union Church of Manila is celebrating Missions Month. As a testimony to the international nature of our church commitment to missions, we will be reciting different creeds from around the world in place of the Apostles' Creed. These creeds are from different people groups who have written their own confession of belief in words that are more culturally appropriate to them. Today, let us recite together the Korean Creed. We believe in the one God, maker and ruler of all things, father of all humanity, the source of all goodness and beauty, all truth and love. We believe in Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, our teacher, example, and redeemer, the savior of the world. We believe in the Holy Spirit, God present with us for guidance, for comfort, and for strength. We believe in the forgiveness of sins, in the life of our love and prayer, in grace equal to every need. We believe in the word of God contained in the Old and New Testaments, as the sufficient rule both of faith and of practice. We believe in the church, those who are united in the living Lord for the purpose of worship and service. We believe in the kingdom of God as the divine rule in human society and in the family of God where we are all brothers and sisters. We believe in the final triumph of righteousness and in the life everlasting. Amen. seated. Good morning, UCM. I'm Dr. Pao, a missionary doctor supported by UCM, currently serving with Hope Alive Healthcare, which is also supported by you. Over the past few years, we've been blessed to see the Lord's guidance in Hope Alive and how he surrounded us with his UCM family for support. Here at Hope Alive Clinic, we are a free pregnancy clinic focused on providing care for those living in impoverished situations around us. By giving free care, we give accessible care, which is also high quality care based on world health standards. At the heart of our clinic is sharing the gospel with our mothers through word and deed, by showing compassion and care, gifting Bibles, praying with each mother, and sharing God's word at each checkup visit. We are privileged to intertwine physical care with spiritual care, all for the glory of God. We provide thorough checkups for both mother and baby, praying for each one, showing they are truly cared for. We also have a free mini Christian counseling session at the clinic 
giving the mothers opportunity to process the difficulties in life in a safe place. We love to deliver at clinic. About 90% of our mothers are able to deliver at clinic. And we have an outstanding record in the community for delivering safety in using gentle birthing techniques. We continue to care for both mother and baby for six weeks post-delivery and they maintain the relationship through family planning services and discipleship groups. So at Hope Alive Clinic, it has been such a blessing to help mothers and their families. As we continue to see the heartbreaking situations uh, when people can't access good quality care, it really breaks our heart. And so God has brought to our team the dream of expanding into a hospital. It will start off small at about 20 beds and cover the basics such as pediatrics, obstetrics, surgical, and mental health and internal medicine. We'll also be focusing a lot on outpatient care, trying to help people before they get to hospital with things like blood pressure checks and diabetes checks. We're so excited to share that we already have this land purchased nearby for the expansion and architects are already working on the design. If you would like to be involved with Hope Alive, please come and talk to us. We're specifically seeking counselors, monthly discipleship group leaders, medical professionals, and business and fundraising expertise, especially regarding the hospital expansion. As we strive to build a place of God's compassion and respect for all, both staff and clients, James 1.27 is our key verse. It reminds us that true religion is to care for the most vulnerable and to stand against the corruption of the world. May God be glorified in all we do. Brothers and sisters, now to lead the anthem, our uh, Philippine Missionary Institute scholars. We get to partner with these brothers and sisters in their ministerial education endeavor. They will give the anthem and also lead us in our closing hymn.
Amen. Thank you. Well, as we continue in worship this morning, I invite us all to stand once more and turn to those around you. Greet one another as we continue in worship. Well, I have thoroughly enjoyed our Missions Month and hearing from our partners, hearing from different musical groups and watching different dances, reading different creeds and, and, and worshiping in different forms than what we're uh, normally accustomed to at Union Church. And, and I hope it's been a blessing for you. One of the things I've really enjoyed, though, is, is hearing the different perspectives of our, our speakers that are all from Union Church of Manila who have served in the mission field or in NGOs in some capacity or another. And, and today we have another such of those people, uh, Jess Smith, who attends the first service at Union Church of Manila. And uh, this is actually his first time to the second service. So uh, uh, we can welcome him for the second service, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, he's here with his wife and his two boys, uh, Nate and Jake, back there in the back. And uh, we are, we're glad to have them at Union Church of Manila. Uh, they started in the mission field around 25 years ago and have been serving for most of their adult lives in different parts of Asia, starting in uh, Nepal, up in the Himalayas. Uh, so a little bit different climate uh, than here in the Philippines that takes, I'm sure, a little bit of adjusting, but they have been passionate church planters and passionate about strategizing as to how to plant churches so that nations ultimately will hear the gospel of the Lord. And so uh, uh, I, I invited him to come and share this uh, with us at Union Church of Manila. Has a lot of great insights. Can we just give a warm welcome to Jess Smith? Thank you, Jess. Pastor Chad. Thank you, Pastor Chad. And thank you, UCM, for just giving me the opportunity to share a little bit from God's Word uh, and from our experiences about missions. Um, Without further ado, I want to jump straight into it. Um, Pastor Chad, a few weeks ago, he said, uh, would you share um, about missions uh, from, you know, uh, here, here at UCM? And he asked me the question, he said, I said what, what's the topic? And he said, would you speak on why, would you share on why missions? Why missions? And it really impacted me the way he worded it, why missions? Because whenever I've spoken on missions or whenever I've heard others speak about missions, the go-to passage has often been in Matthew 28 from the Great Commission. But as I thought about his question, what I realized was Matthew 28 and the Great Commission doesn't really provide perspective, at least not to the extent that I was thinking about, in regards to why we engage in missions. It talks about the what we do, maybe the how we do it, but not necessarily the why. So Pastor Chad's question, why missions, is critical when we think about missions, because it shapes everything. If we understand why missions, it shapes everything about what we do and how we do it in the mission field. So this morning, I want to start by looking at a few passages of Scripture um, to see what insights it provide, they provide in relation to why we engage in missions. And then after we've gained some perspective on why, I want us to look at what and how we do that, uh, how we can be more effective in missions. So that's a lot to cover in 30 minutes. So we're going to jump straight into it. I'm going to open us in a word of prayer, and we'll go from there. Father God, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to be here this morning to worship you, to look at your word, uh, to hear from you uh, what you might say. Father, I pray that you would speak through me this morning, through the music and the worship. Father, that we would be drawn closer to you, Father, and we'd have greater understanding of who you are and what we need to do in relation to bringing you glory. We love you and praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So, up on the screen, you'll see a number, 660 million, 660 million. So, when we're talking about mi missions, what does that number represent? As I was preparing, I asked a few folks what they thought that number meant, and most of them were kind of surprised or uh, kind of questioned. They said, the number of lost people? 
And that's not what this number represents. This number represents 660 million, represents the number of evangelical Christians around the world worshiping our Lord. Um, uh, yeah, out of 7.9 billion people, there are only 660 million evangelical Christians who know and worship him. And that's a, a high estimate. That means that there are 7.2 billion people around the world who do not know Christ and who are not worshiping and worshiping our king and making him known. So if we start by focusing on the lost, it's easy to forget why missions exist. And that is first and foremost to glorify, glorify our God and King. I want to say it again because it's the heart of what Pastor Chad asked. Why missions exist. Missions exist first and foremost to glorify our God and King. Yes, missions is about reaching the lost and that's part of the process, but they're not the focus. The focus of missions is the glory of God and the result of seeing God glorified through the praise and worship of those who follow him requires us, the church, to take the gospel to the nations. The activities needed to increase that worship and praise of him, our Lord and King, is sharing the gospel, making disciples, and planting healthy, reproducing churches among every tribe, nation, and tongue. So I want us to look at a few passages from Scripture that provide more clarity on this subject of why missions exist to glorify God. The first one is Isaiah 43, 7. It says, everyone who is called by my name and whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, even who I have made. What we see here in this passage is that we were created for God's glory. When we know and exalt him in worship, we magnify his glory and we give it the focus that he deserves. Let's go on to Exodus 20, verses 2 through 5. And look at the Ten Commandments. This may seem a, an odd place to start for talking about missions. But I think it provides some of the foundations for helping us understand why God's glory is the focus of everything we do in our lives as well as missions. When we look at the Ten Commandments, we know that they're divided into two parts, right? Relationship with God and relationship with others. And when we think about the Ten Commandments, we often only see the short bullet points like in the two tablets up there on the screen. But when we look at Scripture, God actually has a lot more to say about our relationship with Him than the abbreviated summary that we sometimes see on the tablets in the slide. First, in the Ten Commandments, where does God start? God starts with Himself. Not relationships, not others, not with anything else. He starts with Himself. God says, I'm not going to read all of that up there, but I'm going to summarize some things for you. God says, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not worship them. You shall not worship any other god or serve them. For I, I am the Lord your God, and I am a jealous God. What does that mean? It means that God comes first. Our God is jealous for his glory. No one and nothing comes before our God in our lives in our ministries, or in missions. God and God alone is worthy of our praise and our worship, our honor, and our glory. As such, missions exist to magnify his glory among the nations in the time that we have before Christ's return. Going on to one more passage, Isaiah 48, 6 says, For my own sake, for my own sake, I will act. For how can my name be profaned? And my glory I will not give to another. The context here in Isaiah is in relation to Israel, but the point is clear and holds true for everything. God desires to be glorified. His glory comes first, and he will not allow his glory to be given to others. 1 Corinthians 10.31 con continues to highlight this. It says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Everything that we do is for his glory, and that applies to missions. Along these lines, the Westminster Shorter Catechism summarizes this passage in its very first statement by asking the question and providing the answer that the chief purpose of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And again, 
The point is that the primary purpose of men and women on this earth is to glorify God. And in the same way, this holds true for missions. The starting point for missions is understanding that it exists to bring glory to our God. And, and finally, every Sunday, Pastor Chad continues the service with a benediction, and sometimes he references Psalm 67.1. It starts with, God be gracious to us and bless us, and cause he has caused your face to shine upon us. But in verses 2 through 4, it goes on to say, that you may be known among the earth, among the earth your salvation among all nations. Then it goes on to say, let, you, <clears throat> let the peoples praise you, O God. Let the people, all peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. Friends, missions exist so that all peoples will praise and worship our God and King, so that our God may be glorified among the nations. John Piper in Psalm 67, referencing this very same passage in his book, Let the Nations Be Glad, states, Missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Missions exist because worship doesn't. Worship is the ultimate, not missions, because God is ultimate, not man. When this age is over and the countless millions of the redeemed fall on their faces before the throne of God, missions will exist no more. Why missions? Missions exist to glorify God. Sharing the gospel with the lost, making disciples and planting healthy reproducing churches so that they too can praise and worship him is how missions takes place. So, if missions exist to bring glory to God, let's look at what it means to bring him glory. The Greek word for glory here is doxa. Doxa. And in its context, in this context, it means to honor, to praise, to worship our God. It means to enhance a reputation, to recognize our God, to increase his fame and prestige. It means to give him honor through public, public praise and approval, to acknowledge his renown. When we help the lost understand who God is, that he's the creator of the world, the creator of the universe, that he is the most high God, that he's our king, we bring gl glory to our God. When we share the gospel and the lost respond in faith to Jesus Christ as their Lord, our God is glorified. When we honor, praise, and worship God among the nations and help them do the same, we bring glory to our God. Now, as Pastor Chad often says parenthetically, doxa is also the root word for doxology, which means literally to speak glory. So when we sing a doxology, praise God from whom all blessings flow, it literally means to bring glory to God, right? My kids are shuddering in the background because I'm not a really good singer. But uh, that's the purpose. I'm just here to glorify God. Again, Piper provides some perspective on what it means to glorify God when he writes, glorifying God means feeling and thinking and acting in ways that reflect his greatness, that make much of God, that give evidence of his supreme greatness, of all of his attributes, and the all-satisfying beauty of his manifold perfection. To summarize, glorifying God takes place through Christ as we seek to honor and revere him as our Lord and King. It takes place through praise and worship, seeking to walk in obedience and holiness to our God. And it takes place through the good stewardship of our spiritual gifts, of the resources he's given us, and the relationships that God has put in our path. So when I say that missions exist to glorify God, it means that God's glory is being magnified among every tribe and nation by more and more people knowing and worshiping him and making him known. Revelation 7, 9 through 12 gives us a picture of God's vision, a picture of the future, of what we long to see. It says, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could count, from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, and palm branches were in their hands. And they cry out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, who sits on the throne and before the Lamb. They're worshiping God. They're praising Him. 
And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fought, fell on their faces before the throne and they worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. When Christ returns and mission ceases to exist, at that time, all that will remain is God's chosen people, you, standing before the throne, singing praise and worship to the glory of our God. So why missions? Missions exist to see our king worshiped by every nation, tribe, and tongue for his glory from now till eternity. Okay, so hopefully, hopefully you've gained a little perspective on why missions. The question now becomes, how do we bring glory to God through missions, and what does that look like? So going back to the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19, and 20 is a good starting point. It begins or ends and says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you even until the end of the age. To that end, I want to uh, illustrate this by sharing a little bit from our ministry, which I hope will bring glory to God will be an encouragement to you and provide some direction for all of us as we seek to establish his kingdom and help it grow. When we first moved to the Himalayas, we loved it. But like any new place, it had its challenges. The altitude was about 12,000 feet, so that's a little over two miles. So at times, when we first got there, we'd wake up <gasps> gasping for air. And of course, at that altitude, it's pretty cold. It's not quite like the Philippines. In the winter, we would wear at least three layers of clothes, heavy clothes, plus jackets, hats, multiple layers of socks and boots. We walked around. I don't know if you've ever watched some of this on TV, but the Japanese game shows, and sometimes they put them in these blow-up sumo wrestler outfits, and they bounce around. That's kind of like what we looked like going about our ministry. When Cindy, Cindy washed our clothes, she'd hang them up to dry, and icicles would form before they even began to dry. The bathrooms and showers were outside, and that may not be a big thing here, but when it's cold, it's a little different. And the hot water, well, it wasn't always hot. But even outside the physical challenges, the government wasn't fond of Westerners and actively opposed to Christians and Christianity, which made it difficult to stay there as well as engage in our focus, which was church planning. And then there were the people. We did and still now truly love them. They're easygoing and friendly. Most of them were farmers and shepherds and nomads. They had very little formal education. To put this into perspective, we were often asked, so how long does it take to get from where we are here by bus to where you grew up in the U.S.? They had no concept of geography. One other time I was asked, is the moon the same where you're from? These were the kind of people we were working with. But the spiritual reality was the challenge. Most then and now are steeped in demonic, works-based religion that permeates every aspect of their culture and worldview. The result being that they could not fathom how they could maintain their cultural identity out separate from their local religion. Due to the difficulty of all these things that I've just shared and the pressures that existed, most of the locals had never heard the name of Jesus. Most had never heard the gospel. There were few believers and there were no local churches. To that end, we were faithful in sharing the gospel. And God blessed those efforts. Over time, we began to see some locals come to faith. But we soon realized that our vision and strategy were lacking. We began to see that based on our current efforts, we were not likely going to see a multitude from that people group knowing and worshiping the Lord and making it known. That simply, I mean, we've got 7.9 billion people in the world, and there's 660 million evangelical Christians. The death rate outpaces our efforts then and now. We needed to make some adjustments. What we needed was a clear plan that would guide us in our efforts to plant healthy multiplying churches and something that was simple enough 
for our national partners to reproduce. So after a lot of prayer, plowing through scripture, talking with others, working together, we developed what we now refer to as the core missionary task. It's not about finding a model or some cookie cutter approach to missions, but about identifying best practice and principles from scripture that can help us advance the kingdom to the glory of God. It's a framework that provides strategic direction but allows tactical latitude to to give people the freedom to use tools or resources that they need to meet the cultural context that they work within. It provided a clear path to church. On the surface, it's relatively simple, but each one of these elements have extensive discipleship and training elements related to them. For now, we've only got time to touch on a few of those. So to start with, the first part is abiding in Christ. When we're working with nationals, we'd use hand signals and we'd get a stick and draw things in the sand. The starting point was abiding in Christ. Think about John 17. In this, what we're seeking to do is understand where God's at work and how we can come alongside him. From there, we prayerfully identify and enter new fields of, of service looking for persons of peace as we see in Luke 10 and Mark 7. So what that might look like here in Manila is another district or maybe a block within the city. For us, it it was a people group. If we're looking outside of Manila, it may be some unreached tribes here in Luzon. The next element is reproducing evangelism. Of finding those persons of peace, we clearly proclaim the gospel with passion and power using a tool or method that's culturally appropriate for them. And as they believe, We help them reproduce evangelism with others. This leads to discipleship, starting with the basic tenets of our Christian faith, such as who is God, who is Jesus, who is the Holy Spirit, what is the church, what is baptism, communion, what does it mean to believe and follow Christ. That leads to helping them study the Bible on their own. It's a little bit different from from many of us here when we approach studying, the, studying Scripture, we open our Bibles and we read that. The people we were working with, they had, most had no formal education. They were illiterate. They didn't really have uh, a Bible, so it had to be done through stories and passages that we uh, translated for them. And as, um, as they do so, we encourage them to meet with others, forming small discipleship groups that ultimately lead to the formation of churches. And as all this is taking place, we're seeking to identify and disciple potential leaders who can continue the work and help it grow. But then there's those who may not be leaders. We continue to work with them to see how they can use their spiritual gifts, resources, and talents to help the church grow in health locally as well as expand it in the community and beyond. The goal of all of this was to see healthy, reproducing churches that are worshiping our Lord and expanding His kingdom for his glory. To that end, I'm just going to close with a story that I think will help illustrate all that we've talked about this morning from our ministry in the Himalayas. We've been faithfully serving uh, there for a few years, uh, but hadn't seen much fruit. And because the government was opposed to Christianity, those who did believe were very afraid to share their faith. These are some pictures of different people that we worked with over the years, specifically in the Himalayas. What that meant for us in relation to government opposition, maybe we'd be questioned, maybe we were told, we'd be told to stop. Sometimes it meant being taken in the police station, and at worst, we'd probably be asked to leave the country. But for our national partners, it looked dramatically different. What it meant for them is they would be exiled often by their family. Can you imagine the community that you have in your family? There is no church. To lose that, what that would be like? And then often they were taken in, they were questioned by the police, they were approached a little differently than the way they did with us. They were questioned strongly, some were tortured, they were in prison. So, uh, yeah, they had a lot more to lose than we do. So we began to pray that God would connect us with strong, courageous local believers that we could partner with to advance his kingdom. Well, when God's people pray, he, he hears and he responds. We got put into co- contact with some local, a local couple who were strong believers in another country. Um, their culture was the same one that we were working with, 
and they wanted to come back and engage their people with the gospel. So over the next year or so, we traveled back and forth to meet with them and work out how we could move forward. When we would arrive, we would often meet their home was not much bigger than this stage, everything. Maybe 15 feet by 15 feet, concrete, just a, just a cinder, cinder, concrete cinder block structure. We'd meet, they had a mattress on the floor, maybe a small bookcase. We'd have Bibles all over the floor in different languages. We'd go through those and study them and pray together and ask God to reveal to us, to teach us from his word, how we needed to move forward. One of the first issues we discussed was, what's your vision? What do you want to see happen? You want to go back, but to do what? So, starting point of scripture. We looked at scripture, we prayed, we talked, said, what do you think? They said, well, we want to go back to our countrymen and we want to, we want to share the gospel with our family. I said, great, that's, that's wonderful, praise God. We talked some more, we prayed. I then asked the question, I said, do you think that's all that God has for you to do? Is it just your family or is there more? We pressed pause. They went back to their home to consider that question and pray. The next day they came back and I asked the same question. What, what's our vision going to be? They said, we understand what you're saying, Jess. They said, it's gonna, we, we want to go back and we want to reach our family. We want to reach our community with the gospel. Praise God. That's a great vision, right? But is there more? Is there more that, than that? They went back to their home. They prayed. The next day, as they were coming up the hill, I saw them. And you could tell something was different. I mean, it was almost like a light. I mean, you could tell a light bulb had went off. And they were almost running. So when they got to the top of the hill, I said, hey, what's going on? And they said, we understand what you're saying now. We're going to go back. Our vision is to go back and share the gospel, make disciples and plant churches, not just with our family, not just among our community, but with our whole nation. I said, that's a God-sized vision. They said, whoa, whoa just wait, there's more. I'm thinking, what? A lot of times our national partners, our national brothers and sisters, teach us some things that we should have known already. They said, we're not just going to reach our family and our friends, our community. When God reaches our nation, we're going to go to the next country over and reach that one as well. Yeah. From there, the, the issue of support came up, right? Like it always does. How are we going to provide for our family? How are we going to live there? What is that going to look like? Again, what do we do? I don't, I'm not sure either. We look at Scripture, see what Scripture has to say. And they came to two conclusions. In Scripture, from Scripture, God will either send out through the local church or people will get a job, right? They'll, they'll work. I said, well, what do you think is going to happen here? They said, well, the local church doesn't exist, so I guess we're going to have to get a job or work. I said, okay. Of the two, getting a job or starting a business, which one do you think we need to take? They said, well, if we work, we know how it's going to be, and we won't have a lot of opportunity to go out and do ministry. I think we need to figure out how to start a business to facilitate missions. I said, okay. So that was what we did. I said, what, what are you thinking? Looked at stuff, and uh, my background was not going to seminary to come out and be involved in missions because I couldn't figure out where the bulk of the lost are is in restricted access countries. And I couldn't see how a seminary degree that the government was aware of was going to open those doors and allow me in. So I took a business approach, and it came to bear here. As we talked, they said, well, Jess, um, we think we, we have an idea. We, we, we think it's good. We want to sell thermoses. I said, thermoses? They said, yeah, you know, like those, those metal containers, and you, you put cold water or hot water in them, and, uh, you know, it's got a cork on the top. We want to sell those. I said, oh, okay. Well, I never thought about selling thermoses before. I said, why did you, how did you come up with this? And they said, they kind of looked at me like I was an idiot, and they said, it's obvious. It's cold here, and people need hot things to drink, and this keeps it hot. I said, okay. Well, the logic is there. We're on the right track. I said, but how many thermoses are you going to need sh to sell in a month? We ran the numbers, and it was somewhere in the neighborhood of about 1,000 thermoses a month. I said, do you think you can sell 1,000 thermoses? They said, no, I don't think this is going to work. 
We looked at two or three other things before they finally said, we've, we've decided, I feel like the Lord is leading us to start a small restaurant. I said, great, that sounds good. Except in my mind, I was thinking, I've tasted your cooking, and it's not really that good. So I don't know how this is going to work for you. They said, be that as it may, we believe this is the direction the Father's leading. So the next step was to get them some, to go to some cooking classes, learn how to cook a little bit better, which they did, and they did learn how to cook. But from there, it was, uh, how do we handle security issues, right? I've already shared about the government, so it wasn't as if it was, there wasn't going to be persecution. It wasn't as if there wasn't going to be a, a security issue. It was just a matter of when. When was it going to happen? And then the question was, how are we going to prepare for it? So we looked at Scripture. We looked at Acts. How did, how did the apostles, how did new believers respond to persecution? And so the way we approached it at that point was, I said, I'm going to pretend like we did a role play. I'm going to pretend like I'm the police. You're going to be you. And we're going to practice how we're going to respond, right? Like, so that we're not caught off guard when that happens. So I'm kind of intense anyway, and got even more so and said, okay, are you, you know, are you a Christian? And she said, uh, his wife said, no, no, I'm not a Christian. I said, all right, time out, time out. You know, as Christians, we can't deny who we are in Christ. We looked at Scripture. We got a little more undergirding in that. She said, okay, we got that, right? I'm not going to deny who I am in Christ. I said, okay. Back to the role play. Are you a Christian? Yes, I am. I'm a Christian. All right. I love the Lord. All right. Are you a missionary? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I start. Time out. Time out. Let's look at Scripture. Does it ever say that we need to say that or is anything like that? We looked at Scripture and said, no, it's probably not a good idea to go out and shout to, to the government that we're going to be missionaries. So what did they conclude? They said, we can't deny who we are in Christ, and we'll just tell them that we're here doing business as Christians. Okay, so they did that. They moved forward. The next thing was getting them back, right? They're in another country. We've got to get them from one country back across the Himalayas into the country that they're from. So they sold everything they had, which wasn't very much. They put it in a backpack, like what your kids or grandkids would carry to school. And then we went down and found some truck drivers, right? Some big trucks, and they were carrying 50-gallon uh, drums back across the border to that other country. And we talked with them, and we got them two uh, empty 50-gallon drums, and they got in those 50-gallon drums and drove back across the border. You might think a 50-gallon drum is kind of like uh, those big blue trash cans that we have here, uh, kind of like one of those drums in the back of this truck. For two days... They traveled across the Himalayas to get back to their people. It was a long trip, but they made it. And once they were there, we began to work the plan. They set up the small restaurant right down from a temple. While they served customers food, they built relationships as they shared the food. They got a small TV, and they set it up, and they would show local soap operas two or three times. And then the third one, they would show the Jesus story. So they were sharing the gospel as they served people, and the people were watching the Jesus film as they ate. And as they did that, at the end of each day, they had a, a jar, and they would put a little bit of the money that they had saved or made from the day, and they put that in the jar. Because the goal was, the view was, the belief was that God was going to work through these activities, through them sharing the gospel. The discipleship group was going to be formed. The church was going to be established. And then one of two things that would happen. The new disciples would then run that business, continue it, be the formation of a small church, and then them, they themselves, or maybe one of their disciples would then take that, the money in that jar and use it as seed capital to go start another small restaurant or maybe sell thermoses one day away by bus. That's what they were doing. <clears throat> God was at work and people started to come to faith. At that time... As they were sharing, uh, two young girls about the ages of 13 and 16, uh, they came to Christ. They accepted faith. And our local partners employed them to come and help them at their restaurant, serving food, learning how to cook, that kind of thing. They hired them to help there. And while they would serve food and run the shop, our two local partners would go out in the countryside and share the gospel. 
and do discipleship. Well, when God's kingdom is expanding, Satan strikes. One evening, our local partners were out in the countryside in a village sharing the gospel. Those two girls called him and said, uh, we got a problem. The community is gathered outside of the restaurant here, and they're ready to come in here and at best hurt us, if not kill us. Now think about it. Think about your kids, your, I don't know, 10, 11, 12, 13-year-old daughter or son. Think about your grandkids. They're in there working at the restaurant. Probably, it wasn't much larger than this. A couple of windows here, some tables, double doors right here. And outside the door, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of people from the community that can't stand you. They don't know you, but they know you represent our God. They want to come in there and they want to tear your head off. They want to hurt you. Two young girls, brand new believers, they call our, our local partners. They said, what do we do? Local partner says, we can't get back. It's a day away. We, we're not going to be able to, to get back to you. So what do they do? We got to pray. I wasn't there, but I believe what they, but what they said. Two girls got down on their knees and began to pray. <clears throat> they prayed that God would, uh, would protect them, provide for them, would uh, take care of them. They said later at that moment as they prayed, God sent down an angel that planted itself at the front of the restaurant. Needless to say, the rest of the community was terrified. They had never seen anything like that happen. Their religion doesn't function like that. Their gods have no power like that. They quickly dispersed. Can you imagine the impact that that had on those two girls' faith? The impact that that had on the believers in that community. In around six months, their restaurant was profitable. But more importantly, God had used them to lead hundreds of locals to the Lord and start about ten small churches. Of these new believers, they had identified six potential leaders, and we were starting to develop them to take the gospel to the rest of the provinces or prefectures where they worked, where they lived. There's a lot more that I could share in relation to this. Their story and the challenges that they faced are not unlike what we see in the book of Acts. The book of Acts ends in chapter 28, but it's actually a book unfinished. The book of Acts sets in motion the work of the church from then until now with countless unrecorded stories like the ones I've just shared here with you. They're unrecorded because it's not about them. It's not about the people. It's not about the numbers. And now we're back to where we started. Why missions? These stories and these events are all about one thing, the glory of our God and King. Why missions? Missions exist for the glory of our God so that one day every nation, tribe, and tongue will stand before the throne of God, our King, and worship Him forever. The question is now, what do we need to do? Based on all that I've shared this morning, all that you've heard over the past month, I want to encourage you to prayerfully consider the following ways that you can support missions or the ministries here at UCM. How can you better pray for missions? How can you give to missions? And how can you potentially go or help send out missionaries? Let's close in prayer. Father God, our desire is that you are worshiped and praised for your glory. Father, <clears throat> just thank you for the opportunity to be here and to share from your word. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to come here every Sunday at UCM and and worship you, Father. God, I pray for these here that we would take what we've heard, Father, that we would consider it and that you would guide us in knowing how to proceed and further in your kingdom among the nations. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let us pray. Praises to you, Father, from whom all blessings flow. You are the faithful and generous giver of our every need. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to participate in your kingdom work through our offering this morning. And as we offer our giving to you, including our time, our talents, our resources, and all of our being, may you multiply them to advance your kingdom work. And may Union Church of Manila continue to be your channel of blessings to the world so that by our love, through our giving, others will know that we are your children and the gospel may be shared to the world, bringing your name glory to the ends of the earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Now, as we uh, close our time together, the Philippine Missionary Institute is going to lead us in one last song of worship. They have invited us to sing with them. So if you know the words, join in. If you don't, eh, fake it and try and join in anyways. All right? Let's uh, worship the Lord one more time this morning together.
Amen. Thank you, brothers and sisters, for leading us in worship. And we, can we also appreciate Mr. Jess Smith, who's here to share the word and mission today. And uh, I believe you'll be here for a while if someone would like to talk and, and pray. We'll be here as well. Uh, we're going to go from our time of worship into fellowship. Uh, a reminder that we do have several of our partners in mission who are in the fellowship hall. We go there, we can learn about other missions, uh, other ministry engagements, and possibly uh, get involved. If God would nudge you, invite you in. Um, so everyone take part in that, if you will. And to flag up a few things, just upcoming events in the life of the church. This Saturday, uh, all of this is in your bulletin, by the way, is the From High to Mabuhai uh, seminar. This is, uh, if you're new to the Philippines, fairly new as a foreign national, uh, an exploration of Filipino culture uh, so that you can learn about uh, your new country and possibly, uh, or honor and possibly thrive in your host culture. This is open to the public. Invite colleagues, invite people you know that may benefit from this. Uh, it is open. And also, uh, baptism class is coming up next, uh, what is that, October 6th on Sunday for a baptism celebration on the 13th. If it's time to be baptized, we invite you to be a part of that. Uh, and also on the 13th is our anniversary Sunday. We'll celebrate 110 years of God's faithfulness in and through this church. And we'll have, as tradition, the flag parade. So if you would like to carry one of the flags into the sanctuary as a part of that celebration, uh, please just let that be known at the Fellowship Hall info desk. And uh, you better, if you want to carry your own nation's flag, uh, you better go ahead and do that because there may be some other, uh, someone else who may want to do that as well. So go ahead and do that. Thank you. All right, before we close in our liturgy, if there's anyone here who would like to receive prayer, we have a prayer team who would love to pray with you about anything that's going on in your life. If you want to know more about the wonderful, glorious gospel that we preach about every Sunday, we would love to share with you about that as well. If you'd like to know more about missions, Jess would love to share with you about that as well. And so we would encourage you to talk with somebody after the service this morning. So let's close in our liturgy. As our service, as our gathering ends... Our service begins, and the people of God respond by saying, Go then, loved ones, you are sent. Let us receive our benediction. May he, who is mighty and never changing, grant you his great energy and passion, resolve to never grow weary in doing good for the glory of his marvelous name. Amen, amen. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.